Hi, I'm Trey On. Welcome to Equipping the Saints, and I'm here with my beautiful daughter, the co-host, and the executive director and executive producer, Joy. Why don't you just uh, share a little bit about yourself, because Hello. I want people to know you. Hello, mm -hmm. my name is Joy, and we live in Pasadena, California. You are the senior pastor of H Rock Church, and I am the executive director of Chan Ministries, which is a new media leg for right. your ministry. And also, you're the mother of two. I'm the mother of two beautiful children, that? Annabelle and Kate. Caleb, and I'm enjoying being here, so thank you for having me. Well, thank you. For those who are, are new to the show, the reason why we call it Equipping the Saints is based on Ephesians chapter 411, that he's given some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry until we come to the unity of faith and mature man and experience the fullness of the measure and the stature of Christ. Well, I am so excited about today's show because I have my dear friend Robert Henderson with me and his new book, The Power of God's Grace or Operating in the Power of God's Grace. And uh, this is a cliffhanger. I'm gonna just pause for a moment because we have to go to an announcement now and then we're gonna come back and interview Robert. Well, welcome back. I'm here with my dear friend, Robert Henderson. And when I say dear friend, we're talking about we've known each other because we were part of the same apostolic team as our mentor, Peter Wagner. Absolutely. And it's amazing over 20 years of now running together to advance his kingdom. It's amazing that it's been 20 years. I, just, I mean, when I stop and think about that, how could it be 20 yeah. years? It really has. Yeah. But Robert comes to our church every year to minister. He's part of Harvest International Ministry, part of the International Apostolic Team. You've been a church planner, pastor, an incredible teacher, prophetic teacher, and you have really uh, have carried a burden for this nation. And I want to thank you for the way that you have equipped us in how to pray, because you hit on a real, and we're going to get into this more specifically later on, but uh, you just have taught us how to pray effective prayers. Yeah, and you know, I love the title of uh, the, the title of the show, Equipping the Saints, yeah. because that's a passion of mine. And, and in the whole realm of, of, of prayer, People feel so inadequate in that particular area. Yeah. They just they just they feel like, well, I don't know how to do this, not knowing that if we take that first step, then the Holy Spirit comes along and does help us because He says, when we don't know how to pray as we ought, He comes and helps our weakness. Yes. And so, of course, with the Court of Heaven message, which is basically what I'm really kind of known for around the world, that that message has actually helped people to step into a dimension of prayer and you know find some breakthroughs that maybe they they yeah. haven't found in other places. Yeah, I know we're going to come and talk about this more specifically. But in a succinct way, why don't you just share what's the difference between praying the, according to the courts of the heaven in a legal way versus a uh, normal intercessory prayer that most people pray? Well, I, put, I, I teach that like when Jesus taught on prayer in the book of Luke, he put prayer in three dimensions. In Luke 11 yes. and Luke 18, he taught how to approach God as Father, then he taught how to approach God as friend. And then he taught how to approach God as a judge. And of course, most of us have heard about God as our Father, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, some of us recognize that we can come before God as our friend, that he actually wants to be our friend. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. But some, a lot of us don't realize that God is also judge, and not in a bad way. Yeah. You know, not in the sense, oh, he's going to judge me. Because actually, when we come before him as judge, we are petitioning him to release his judgments against the adversary. Exactly. We're, we're asking him to judge the adversary so that any resistance he's bringing against us and bringing against the purposes of God, that judgment can come out of heaven based on what Jesus did for us on the cross and free us from those resistance restrictions so that we can come fully into everything Jesus died for can us Can you give us just a brief testimony or an example of praying this way and what you have seen? Yeah, well, you know, the first time that it happened to me, I was actually in a prayer meeting in South Africa, and we were, my wife and I were in a bad situation. I mean, for like three years, we were just being devoured, and I couldn't figure out why. And I mean, I was doing the same things I'd always done and had breakthroughs and all this, but for three, two to three years, just nothing. And I went and a, and a person had a prophetic word. And what they saw was that there had been a covenant made with a demonic entity in my bloodline. And when I went before the Lord and repented uh, for that, I took, I put, took ownership, like in the Old Testament, Nehemiah, Daniel, they would repent for themselves and the sins of their fathers. That's called identification repentance. Identification yeah. repentance. And when I did that, yeah. when I repented and asked then that a legal verdict would be rendered against that which was claiming a right to devour me, it all stopped. 
Wow. Two years plus of That's, devouring stopped. Are you talking about financial devourment? Or it was financial. About- it was reputation. It was problems with children. Uh, you pretty well name it. I tell people I would compare my horror story right. with anybody else's. We, it was not a good time. It was not. A, it was not a happy time in the Henderson house. But and we couldn't. We could not. We could not figure out what was causing it. We couldn't right. make it stop. That was the thing. And when I dealt with that, it stopped immediately. Well, it's really interesting because John 10, 10, we quote, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. But it also says a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he has absolutely no legal right to steal from us unless we give it to him That's right. through ignorance or by intentional sin. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, First Peter 5, 8 is a really good scripture because mm-hmm. it talks about uh, being be sober, be vigilant, so be on guard for your adversary. That's the Greek word antidikos, and it literally means one who brings a lawsuit. So wow. the, your, your antidikos, your so adversary, legal the devil. Yeah. The devil. So it tells us who it is. He walks about his roaring line seeking whom he may devour. So the Satan can only devour if he discovers a legal right to do it from. And and so because he's the antidecos, he's the one that brings a lawsuit. So when we come before the courts of heaven, we are asking that what Jesus did for us would now speak in our behalf. In any legal right he's claiming, that that thing would be revoked. The interesting thing to me about this is that this is Peter, a New Testament apostle. Right. Who is literally saying that if you don't, if you're not on guard, the enemy can still build some kind of a legal case against you. Right. And so, so if we realize that, then I here, here's what the court of heaven makes you do: it makes you live a life of repentance. <laughs> it really does. It Absolutely. makes you live a life of repentance, and and to seek to live a more holy life, yeah. realizing it's not God that's going to get you; it's the enemy that right. can discover a legal right that that can allow him, right. the enemy, to to work his devices. So, how do you us. argue against, especially? Joy, there are a lot of young people who just say, well, we're under grace and yeah. we're the new covenant and uh, Jesus became a curse for us already and yeah. so we're not under the... Co- how, how, how do you... And some of the things you're talking about, you're talking about bloodline and things that are... There's generational blessings and then there's also generational curses, right? You talk about mm-hmm. the bloodline, you talk about the occult and all that. Yes. So can you get a little bit more into that? Yeah, you know, you know, I think that there's, there's two... The more I've thought about this and, and because I'm taught it and taught it and taught it, I think there's a difference between iniquity, Mm -hmm. uh, which is the history of sin in a bloodline. That's Mm -hmm. basically what iniquity is. Um, But for for instance, David said in Psalms 32, he spoke of sin, transgression, and iniquity. Mm -hmm. I've just done a little bit deeper study on it. The word sin actually means to fall short, but it is a trespass against the holiness of God. Transgression is a trespass against the authority of God. Those are two different things. It's one thing to sin against the holiness of God. It's another thing to sin against the authority of God. Korah sinned against the authority of God, and the ground opened up Mm -hmm. and swallowed up him and his house. But then he said iniquity, which is the whole issue of history, the the history of sin in a bloodline. Um, And so so I think, I believe that that the enemy, because I could tell you testimonies of my own life, the enemy can actually still use the sin of the fathers Mm -hmm. to work against us, but... If there were covenants that were made mm-hmm. with demon powers, oh, and by the way, iniquity can only go to the third or fourth generation. That's the standard of God's word. Mm-hmm. God's word says that He would visit the sin, uh, the, the iniquity, to the third or fourth generation. And so, I believe that that the enemy cannot go past the word of God. He mm-hmm. cannot go past what the word of God says. But covenant, on the other hand, and I've really wrestled with this, is always. Something like he said, God keeps covenant for a thousand generations. Right. Covenant is forever. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, a husband and wife get married. It's until death do us part. If you right. right, and so so covenant. If there's been covenants made with demon powers, that I believe inadvertently or on purpose. Mm-hmm. Those things can go way past third or fourth generations. It, so how does one know, though? I mean, you know, it's like uh, you're talking about if this was a, a thousand generation, yeah. you yeah. know, and that goes back to your founding fathers before. of America, you yeah. know, that. What, what, this, this is what, this is how I know. This is the way I know. Number one, I've had uh, some seer gifts and some prophetic people that actually discern things. Yeah. And so on the basis of what they understood, I just did some repentance. But then I myself have, have had dreams and, uh, Dreams are a really prominent way that the Lord speaks personally to me. Uh, for instance, 
I had a dream when 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 um, it was like my life was just beset by delay, mm-hmm. denial, uh, fr- uh, promises would never come to fruition, all those kind of things. And I had a dream, and in my dream, my great great grandfather had through negligence injured someone. And because of that, there was a present day judgment against me. I woke up from the dream thinking this is a natural thing, a literal thing. And then when I got awake, uh, awoke, uh, I woke up, I really I understood, oh, wait, wait, this is a dream. But I knew God was showing me something. So I dealt with that before the Lord, before the courts. I said, Lord, I repent for negligence in my life and my family line, but also it's specific for my great, great grandfather. Anything he did that would have allowed someone else to be hurt through negligence, yeah. I repent of. Well, he immediately breakthroughs started coming into my life. I mean, and and that are still happening to this day. And the Lord said to me, he said, your great great grandfather through negligence stole the dreams of someone away. Therefore, the enemy claimed the legal right to steal your dreams away. And when I dealt with that, when I dealt with it out of the revelation of God, everything started breaking open. And the door is closed for, for you. For your children, I don't know, if your grandfather. Yes. And that's it. And that's the other thing. The moment I dealt with these this iniquitous things and some of those covenants that were shown prophetically, my children didn't even know what I'd right, done. Right. They started coming becoming free from all. I mean, I, I say they were making stupid choices. I'm like, what's wrong <laughs> with you kids? You weren't raised this way. Right, right, right. But watch. All of them started coming free mm. from, from from the, the things, and they also began to move into their destiny. You know, Incredible. Jesus said, wisdom is vindicated by our children. That's In good. other words, you know something's wise because of the fruit. And here you've seen, you've been praying all your life, and yet all of a sudden when you begin to understand the legal system, so to speak, and prayer and, and the kingdom, and you tapped into yes. any kind of legal right the enemy would have, that's when you started to see massive fruit. That's right. And so this is amazing because we're getting ahead of ourselves. We were talking about something that we said we would talk about later. (laughs) But I do want to talk about your new book, Operating in the Power of God's Grace. And I know we only have, uh, actually, we have to now take a break. So let's take a little break and then come back and let's talk about your newest book. Awesome. Well, welcome back. I'm with my dear friend, Robert Henderson. Of course, my daughter is co-hosting with me. And Robert, I, I'm so amazed at the revelation God's been given you, but there's one question I wanted to go back to before we move on to your book. Uh, how do you prevent yourself from becoming really introspective and getting into morbid introspection and saying, and start doing history, uh, studying in a negative way, your his, historical background mm-hmm. to look for whatever might be hindering your breakthrough? Yeah, and that's a really good question because what I tell people, the, uh, the caution I try to give people is if the Lord doesn't bring revelation to you about something in your bloodline, then don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything that I've ever actually successfully dealt with in my own bloodline, it came as a result of revelation. It's so amazing because I love that because uh, Romans 10, as we know, verse 17, faith comes by hearing, but hearing the rhema or the revelatory word. That's good. And so that's what releases faith to see your breakthrough. So if, if God doesn't show it to you, just move on. Uh, that's what There's I There's no believe. condemnation for those who are in Christ that, Jesus. That's exactly right. That's great because we want to move on to uh, the emphasis on grace. And there is now yes. no condemnation <laughs> right. for those who are in, in Christ Jesus. Why don't you share a little bit about uh, the purpose of this book? Why did you write this book? Well, you know, I've always, of course, we all love the grace of God. Yeah. But, you know, I actually had someone prophetically say, to me uh, when they heard me teach on grace. They said, you will write a book on grace. And they said, and they will say the court of heaven guy is teaching on grace. And because because I believe everything we do is out of the grace of God. It, the grace of sure. God is the empowerment of God. It's the influence of God into our life. It's not it's not just something we get saved by so we get to go to heaven. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually what empowers our life. Uh, the grace of God determines the gifts we have. It, Paul's very clear about that, that he has gifts based on the kind of grace yeah. that he in had. In fact, the Greek word kairos, and we get the word charismatic, the gifts, yes. as well as the word for grace. It's grace. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, I love the grace of God because, again, I tell people, I say, I'm a product of that grace, as, as any of us are. I mean, Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. He, he realized that whatever he had been transformed into, it was a result of his grace. And, you know, like when the 
24 elders are in the heaven and they fall on their face and they cast their thr- their crowns before the throne saying, worthy is the lamb. I always look at that and I think they are acknowledging that that, that which they have won, that which they have, they have obtained is only because of the grace of God that was in their life. Now, what, what do you tell a young person that may have taken what we call hyper grace, uh, I'm under grace, I could do whatever I want, and you know, just abusing grace. Uh, how do you balance the grace of God, the mercy of God, and, and, uh, and yet uh, his high standard of holiness? Yeah, well, Titus 2. Mm-hmm. I say the the hyper grace people never teach on Titus two, because two eleven right? Yes, because what it says it says the great and this is interesting, the grace. The, the, the grace of God has appeared that brings salvation to all people. So in other words, this is the grace that actually causes you to be saved, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously in this present world. So the real grace of God is going to push you into holiness. Absolutely. It is not going to allow you to live in sin and be right. happy. I tell people, I said, you don't realize when you really get saved, your days of sinning and being able to enjoy it are over. Amen. Because if you're really born again, if that grace that comes that has that I believe is a result of the new nature of God coming on that's the right. inside of us. That if that's really come into your life, you cannot sin and right. be happy. You can't do it because because the I tell people anytime I've messed up, I, I'm miserable until I get it fixed. That's but, right. But in to me, that is the grace of God, uh, according to Titus two, that's actually working in my life. That's awesome. And that ties into people reaching their destinies too, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. See, you know, like for instance, what we, we were talking about the court of heaven earlier. One of the biggest pieces of the court of heaven is is the books. There's books in heaven, uh, according to uh, Psalms 139, 16, mm-hmm. that there are books in heaven uh, that contain, our, 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 it says that when they were written, that our substance yet unformed, mm-hmm. our days yet in fashion. So before we ever existed in the earth, there was a book in heaven about us. Wow. Well, here's the issue. What what is your destiny? What is your purpose? You can only discover that by grace, mm-hmm. because because Paul was very clear in Second Timothy one nine. He said to Timothy, according uh, to the he said according to the purpose and and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So purpose and grace have already been appointed to us, and whenever I discover my purpose. I know it's my purpose because there's grace attached to it. So, so I tell people, I say, if you really, really want to know what you're, what you're here for, discover where your grace is. Because that your grace will always be attached to the purpose mm-hmm. you were made for. Which you, you kind of talk about, too, if, like your, your, your purpose and your calling. If, if there's not a grace for it, yeah. you joke, I'm not a basketball player. I was, nah. not, I was mm. physically not made to be a basketball player. Yeah, you well, talk about it. I, I do. I talk about everyone's call. Right, yes. and in fact, the word church ecclesia is called out once, mm. and so we're all called. But I said to discover your calling, though, uh, one of the things I say is two things: look at your natural gifts because that's still grace yes. that God gave you when you were born. People have the gift of leadership. People have the gift of. Um, I think people, even unbelievers, kind of have the gift of giving. You see all yes. these philanthropists giving mm-hmm. all this money away, even though they're not born again. Mm-hmm. But uh, but then I say, look at the spiritual gifts as well. And so, uh, is that something what you're talking about? As yeah, far as Romans the gifts? twelve is yeah. very clear. Those seven gifts mentioned there: yeah. the prophetic realm, the giving realm, the leadership realm, the mercy realm. You know, all of these things. The, the, to me, I believe those those are not just for Christians. Those okay. are those are. Uh, every person that's alive on the planet will have at least one of those that tends to dominate now, their well, life. Well, how do you answer a person who says, well, you're talking about a prophetic gift there. Mm-hmm. And can unbelievers have a prophetic bent? Oh, I, I believe that. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, I, absolutely. I believe, I see, I, I think too, that prophetic people, <laughs> prophetic, the people that are prophetic in that realm, they, they're really black and white. Yeah. They're like, they're like, okay, they see everything's right or wrong for them. Mercy people are not so much that way. And the, and the issue is sometimes the people with different giftings, but it's the it's the glasses they see life through. Right. And so they end up not being able to relate to this other person here because they're they're seeing they're seeing life through a different a completely different lens than the other person is seeing it based on the grace that was appointed to them before time began. Right. Well, I have a friend of mine who is a prophet in the body of Christ. He said when he was around five or six, he started to see things. He was starting to see demonic. He mm-hmm. was seen into another realm. And so you wonder how these people become 
psychic readers, you know, mm-hmm. and palm readers, uh, people who get into the occult, because I think they had something of a prophetic bent in them that they had, which would be something that God would lead them into a whole different level once they get born again and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that what you're talking about? Absolutely, absolutely. Because because for us to think that, well, I, I love the scripture in Timothy. It's really puzzling. Here's what, here's what Paul said to Timothy. He said, God is the savior of all men, especially those who believe. <laughs> and that, that's a crazy scripture. It is a crazy scripture. I, he, the, I mean, that doesn't mean everybody's going to go to heaven. You have to accept Jesus to go right. to heaven. But, but he says he's the savior of all men, that, that his saving grace on some level touches and affects everybody alive in this planet because he's such a god of love and mercy his sun shines on the on the wicked and on, on the just his, his rain comes on the righteous and the unrighteous right. that's to me but but especially those who believe i mean when we believe we say we, we, we have we're more apt to actually say okay this is who i am yeah this is what god made me to be well it's john three sixteen for god so loved the world yes but whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I love the way it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he desires all to be saved and come to a knowledge so of good. the truth, you know, in verse 4. But you had a question about mercy. What was that question? Yeah, what, I, I think we, we hear our, there's so many scriptures out there. What would you define or distinguish the difference between mercy and grace? I think the, one of the clearest pictures is, is the prodigal son. Mm-hmm. Whenever the prodigal son took the inheritance, ran away with it, when he, came, when he ended up in the pig pen, and uh, came to himself and said, how many of my father's servants have bread enough for the spirit? And so he he says in his mind, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say, let me just be like a, one of the servants. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really interesting because when he gets to the father, he's going to ask him for mercy. Mm-hmm. Because mercy is just let me be like one of your servants. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not asking to be. But he didn't even get to finish the speech he's prepared. Right. He's prepared a speech. I'm going to say, this is what I'm going to say. And the father grabs him, hugs him, and calls for the robe, puts the ring on. And see, that's the grace. So, so he was going to ask for mercy, but God gave him grace instead. Mm-hmm. Because, because, because mercy is, is um, when... When we don't get what we should, do, what we deserve. Mm-hmm. In other words, he 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 would have deserved judgment, but he was going to ask for God to be merciful. But grace is when we do get what we don't deserve. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's it's a positive thing coming right. into our right. lives. And um, you know, I heard a story, I heard a guy say one time, it's like a bank, it's like a bank employee that steals a bunch of money and mm-hmm. gets caught. And so uh, the mercy of the president says, okay, here's what we're going to do. The mercy says, we're not going to press charges. You can't have your job anymore. Go home. Right. You're going to do something else. But you, you're you guilty, but we're not going to press charges. That was mercy. But grace says, you know what? We love you. We're for you. We forgive you. And we're going to promote you to vice president. <laughs> That's grace. Yeah. That's grace. That's, that's why it's supernatural. Yeah. That's why it's yeah. supernatural. And it's the that's right. of God. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that is so good. I love the uh, the uh, prodigal son analogy to really illuminate uh, the truth between grace and mercy. That's amazing. And you know, whenever the Bible says when he clothed him with a robe, when you look those words up, it actually means he put dignity on him. Mm-hmm. See, mercy mercy doesn't necessarily have dignity attached to it, but grace does. Yeah, Grace restores the dignity of who God made us to be. Well, tell us the, uh, the importance of identity, and uh, because you mentioned about how God views you and the importance of knowing that in order to fulfill your destiny. Well, you know, it's quite interesting. Uh, Noah, the Bible says he found grace in the eyes of God. And you could say, well, that means God chose or made a choice to favor him. And it does. But here's what I believe. It it also means that Noah was actually able to see the way God saw him. Wow. And see, that's identity. He found grace in the eyes of God. God was looking at him through the eyes of grace, not eyes of judgment. And the way, this is interesting, the way he understood God saw him determined whether his house was saved or not. He did not come under the judgment everybody else came in because he could see the grace of God toward him in his life. Well, I never saw it that way, that perspective. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. I mean, to me, that's identity. I am of, I'm of value. I'm loved because God, God has, God sees me through His eyes of grace. Well, you know, with the time we have left, I want you to pray for our audience because there's so many under condemnation. They've been living under a lie that 
you know, they're cursed or they're under God's judgment. I'd love to see you break that and pray for a massive infusion of grace. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, I just want to thank you for all those that are watching today. And I want to thank you that you are a God of grace. And Lord, everyone that's living under that spirit of condemnation, shame, Lord, that has actually been an attack against their very identity, I'm asking right now that by faith they would accept everything that the Lord Jesus did for them, that you, Lord Jesus, came to bring grace and truth. So I just release that into their life. And I say, Lord, let them, let supernaturally, wherever they are, let that guilt, that condemnation, that shame come off and let them be free to now see and understand who they are in the dignity that God has created for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want you to get the book, Operating in the Power of God's Grace by Robert Henderson, best-selling author of The Courts of Heaven. And I tell you, if you have not read that book, also check out his website. Go to YouTube and you'll be so enriched by his revelatory teaching. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. Mm -hmm.